secret societies, the secret oaths, and the secret proceedings. Coming to you from the studio of the Stormcatons and the Nemesis Stars, this is Stars, Planet X, Planet X, the transmission, 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 try the best, try the best, try the best. The new city sequence by 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Zero, all engine running. Lift off, we have a lift go. And welcome to the Best Damn Podcast. I'm your host, John Keane. As always, I'd like to thank you guys for joining me. As that you please add, follow, and subscribe. And remember, check us out www.spreaker.com forward slash user forward slash best damn podcast. Also, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash the best damn podcast. Tonight, I am joined by a writer of the Genesis 6 conspiracy who has been on the show before, uh, Gary Wayne. Hey, Gary, what's going on? Hey, so happy to be back. And- so much looking forward to the conversation tonight and hoping uh, we give some information and raise maybe a few eyebrows for people to dig a little deeper into you know wherever the conversation goes so yeah absolutely excited it's been a while and glad to be back on your show yes yes and i'm so glad to have you um of all the different researchers that are out there uh as far as it goes to me there's not very many that still um, hold Jesus Christ in as high regard as you do, um, which is, you know, one of the things about my show, you know, um, I believe he's the Messiah, he's the high priest of the order of Mechizeldek, so I'm very aligned with a lot of the things that, um, the conclusions that you came to as well. Um, you use all kinds of texts, um, explaining the Bible in a way that, uh, you're you're not gonna hear in your normal church, uh, you know, as far as dual prophecy and uh, how the prophecies of old apply to the prophecies of today. Um, it's just very very uh, uh, intriguing the, to say the least. The way that he breaks things down. I'm glad to have him back on. And recently, you have done this series, a few different series actually. Who is Satan? Uh, mysteries ancient signs of the end times uh, this is what I kind of wanted to have you on today to talk about and uh, you know to me uh, one of the biggest questions I think that people have is in the Bible where does it describe the root of the serpent the serpent's root and how it, how it's formed and how we can find it Wow. That's a great question to start the show off, I must say. Uh, excellent question. So uh, let me back up just a, a little bit and let me come around to it. I'll give a little bit of a, a preface as to how I come at things. So if people have checked out my website or checked out my book or checked out some other interviews. You know, I talk about some things that if they're not ready for it, seem quite fantastic. Mm-hmm. And uh, typically... One of the things that sort of in the genre people will ask themselves, particularly as a Christian, is, is, okay, he knows this and he knows that, but does he base everything on the Bible? And so I wanted to underscore that everything I write about in my book or everything that I, I'll tend to write about uh, on any of my commentaries is always measured against the Bible and uh, biblically based. And so when I do dig into specifically aspects of the Bible, I don't tend to reach outside of it if I'm trying to get into the weeds, so to speak, in terms of giving Christians some commentary on some of these subjects that are not talked about. And 
you know, in churches as, as a common rule. And prophecy as a whole is not talked about. Neither is prehistory. And neither is linking those two together so that you can understand prophecy in a way that makes, I think, a little bit more sense. And that's kind of what I do. And my approach to prophecy, so that people know, is, is I'm a literalist, so I take everything literally. And uh, I only define the allegories if it's defined within the Bible. So if we're talking about a dragon, I'm looking for a definition within the Bible, for example. And I also try and use all of the particular prophecies and not be selective. I'm not trying to cherry pick off. I think they all have to work in harmony if it's going to tell the tell the proper prophetic story and narrative. And then the other thing I like to do is I like to look to what Jesus talks about everything first as my guide and assemble all prophecy or doctrine if I'm digging into doctrine around what Jesus says first. So I just wanted to do that as a, as a preface because so many things that I talk about uh, in my book, um, I can't get into the weeds on, but I can on these commentaries and series that, that you mentioned. So when you talk about the serpent's root, I think everybody knows about the serpent seed out of Genesis 3.15. Mm-hmm. And of course there's several different avenues in terms of where that might go. But I think most people skip over what the serpent's root is. And uh, that's why, you know, as was one of the reasons I wanted to write this uh, seven-part series on Isaiah 14, which actually begins in Isaiah 13. So to answer your question on a very narrow basis, uh, the serpent's root is actually quoted in Isaiah 14.29. And, uh, you know, paraphrasing that, depending, and again, depending on which translation people are, are, are using for, for the Bible, um, I'm going to paraphrase the uh, King James Version. Um, it says, out of the serpent's root comes a cockatrice, and the fruit will be a flying serpent. And what's so bizarre about that is it's in the same <laughs> chapter and part of the two-part prophecy of Isaiah 13, 14, but specifically in Isaiah 14, 12, where it's talking about um, Lucifer, as it's, as it's uh, said in the uh, King James Version, which I, I don't think should be tra- uh, translated as, as Lucifer, um, but at, at his fall from grace and in our introduction into uh Lucifer as as this angel that most people equate with Satan, but not everybody. There's a few different views out there. So, mm-hmm. serpent's root comes, you know, comes right out of Isaiah fourteen twenty nine. And I just wanted, to, you know, just to sort of get people comfortable with where we might be going on this, because when we look at the serpent, obviously Satan is described as a serpent and a dragon in in Revelation twelve, yeah. and a cockatrice. If you take that back to the original Hebrew, and it's defined as, I won't give it the Hebrew word here because that's getting, I think, too deep into the, into the weeds, but it's, it's a very much a, like an adder-like serpent, so a poisonous type serpent. So out of the root comes this very poisonous serpent in this prophecy, uh, comes forth, and, and the fruit will be a flying serpent, which sounds like a seraphim. And when you take that back uh, to, to, to Hebrew, it's actually going to be seraph in Isaiah 14.25. So uh, it's got all of these interesting connections in with the Satan um, prophecy in, in Isaiah 14. Now, do you believe that... Um, hell, I, we, I, we didn't address this yet, but... You wrote a series on who is Satan, and you talk about him originally being Hillel, um, an, an angel uh, of the Lord, and that he was a seraphim, and he was something else. He was more than one type of angel. Yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely. And so to pre-qualify that, so if we take back, not the flying part of the flying serpent, take the serpent back, that goes back to seraphs. So let's now look at defining uh, Satan a little bit better, because we know he is a serpent, as with the allegory of 1429 is talking about. And of course, a flying serpent is a dragon, and he's also called a dragon in, in Revelation 12. And so what's interesting is, is as we start matching up 
different other aspects of the Bible that will sort of blend into this is is we see that that um, Satan is uh, also thought to be the same individual that is is talked about in um, in Ezekiel 28, which is kind of where you were going to, and I'm going to come back to uh, okay. what he's referred to as what type of angel. So in Ezekiel 28, he's talked about a cherubim, right? Yep. And he's also talked about as walking amongst the fiery stones around the altar. Yep. Well, cherubim are typically covering angels, so their wings sort of fan and cover the throne of God and the and there you have this altar in front of the throne of God. And they're not walking amongst, they're not described in description in scripture as walking amongst the fiery stones. But if you go back to Isaiah six, where we are introduced with what a seraph is, or seraphim, which is the male plural form of seraph, it talks about these six-winged angels who are like ministers performing at the altar before God where you have the fiery stones. And one of them actually takes a rock or a coal out of it and goes to Isaiah to purify him and to have for forgive, forgiveness of some of, them, of, of his sins. So like a minister. And so seraphim are ministers performing before God. And so we already know Satan is described as a serpent. We know that now that seraphim walk amongst the fiery stones before the altar as they're described in Isaiah 6. We also know that he's described as a cherubim that walks amongst the fiery stones. So people say, well, how could he be cherubim and seraphim? And I think that's a very, very good question, but the descriptions describe him as being the same individual, and I think it describes the greater aspect of who Satan was. That he was, you know, probably at the time before he he was degraded, next to, you know, the Word of God, uh, the Holy Spirit, and God himself, and when I talk about the Word, I'm talking about Jesus, uh, and his name is the Word. Yeah. And so just so that people are following what I'm saying is is that he was greater than the, the regular seraphim and greater than the cherubim. And that's why he was called all of those descriptions like perfect in his beauty and in his, in his wisdom and was probably the greatest creation below the Word and the Spirit that God Manifests and there's different creations for Satan and angels that I think there are there is for the Word of God and for the Holy Spirit. So let's not get confused with that. And also, Satan has nine jewels ascribed to him, which is very very similar to the Levite priests who have twelve stones. Mm-hmm. Which is I think is is kind of prophetic to the aspect that that ministry that's going to end up coming through Jesus is actually going to be greater than the ministry of Satan, who I think was a priest before God in the altar as part of his greater description. So, just to finish this off, because I know people might have some doubts about can the person of Isaiah fourteen twelve and Ezekiel twenty eight be the same individual, and, and and that's why I wanted to get out of the preface. I go to what Jesus says first. So in Luke ten, Jesus clearly describes he saw Satan fall from heaven. Yep. Well, we have both in Ezekiel and in Isaiah Satan being you know falling from heaven and being cast from heaven. So I think clearly. Jesus is ascribing them to be the same, and with that as the guidance, I feel comfortable in netting the different descriptions of Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 together as the same individual, and to all the other references that I have that you pull out from the Bible, just understanding that um, he he, uh, is, you have to take a step back and find out how powerful he was how great of a creation he was before he is degraded because of his rebellion and his sin. Absolutely. I believe he was incredibly high-ranking and uh, 
that's what makes his fall so significant and what makes him um, such a powerful nemesis to mankind. Yeah, and why angels who also are created by God, who know the power of God, who know that he's omnipotent, would actually follow Satan. Not necessarily because they thought perhaps he could win and they could win a war against God. They thought they would probably have to fight. And of course they will and probably did in prehistory. But I think they thought he was such a powerful leader that he could convince God through their actions and their arguments to provide him a separate realm for he and his angels and whoever else he wants in that realm underneath to rule over, to be like God, just as Isaiah 14 talks about. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, make, it makes um, a, a lot of sense when you um, look at it from, from that angle. Uh, what, was he really thinking that he would win, or was he just trying to get something of his own to have dominion over? Everything he does and everything that is in prophecy is to create a counterfeit world. So you're going to have a counterfeit Messiah. You, you have a counterfeit religion. You're going to have a counterfeit millennium. You have everything that's a counterfeit. You have a false prophet. Everything that they tend to do is to be like God, just as Isaiah 14 talks about. Yes. And I think, and I think we take that right back to prehistory, where that's what he was arguing and trying to accomplish, and is still trying to do. Even though I believe that you know, since the resurrection of Jesus and Jesus talking to the spirits in in the abyss, some of, you know, the, uh, the co-conspirators of, of Satan um, in the time of the rebellion and for other sins as well, Jesus went to speak to him, speak to them while still in the grave to explain to them that officially their rebellion had failed and that no matter what happens going forward, they will not get their realm and they will be going to the lake of fire. But that doesn't mean that Satan and the fallen angels would stop with the rebellion. They only have one thing they can do, is, try, is to try and lead as many as humankind away. And to hopefully fall on the mercy of the great God of, of everything to actually, again, be forgiven and to have that realm. But clearly prophecy tells us that's not going to happen. Absolutely. Um, that kind of brings me to where you write about signs of the end times. Um, now, we have seen a lot of what people would call, you know, signs um, in the moon, in the sun, and in the stars, the perplexing of nations, all of these things uh, that the Bible speaks about and warns about. Um, what inspired you to write on signs of the end times, and what, what do you feel is going on with those signs? Well, I think, and I'm going to you know, continue to talk about signs, because I think we're going to be inundated with false signs as well as real signs. Yeah. And so we are given in prophecy what to look for. I don't think we should look too much further than what, you know, Scripture tells us to look for and certainly look for Jesus as that guide in terms of what those signs are going to be looking like. I think Revelation is quite clear in backing up and supporting what Jesus said in terms of what those signs are going to be. But where I think people will sort of go astray is is that they're looking for things that are important to science and they're looking at things that are important to astrology and they're trying to conflate those into the signs of the end times simply because we are going to see some signs in the sky um, but I, I think what we're going to be seeing with some of those skies is like the, the, the stars darkening, the moon turning, or the sun turning blood red and being darkened because of what's going on in Revelation. And we're also going to see at the midpoint of the last seven years, we're going to see the sign of Jesus coming in the sky that everybody in the world will see. So again, to mislead and misdirect people, the evil forces, the rebellious angels, the demons, and the spurious forces that believe in them and follow them and are trying to create this end time, 
um, even though uh, it's going to happen because it's ordained. They would prefer to do it on a different timetable, but they will accept the ordained times. But in the meantime, they're going to be trying to create false signs, false allegories for signs, like astrology, just as what we had last September where people thought that that astrological alignment was the sign of Revelation 12. The woman in well, the dragon. That was, yeah. So, But if that was the case, then that means we would have been three and a half years into the end time already because there's three and a half years that God is going to protect the people fleeing from Judea, which is at the abomination, and we get that time frame also listed in Revelation 12 of about three and a half years for protection from the dragon, even though the dragon and then Antichrist are going to try and and persecute them. And then they turn towards the saints, right? Mm -hmm. This is all in Revelation 12. So, again, I read this literally, um, and, and it describes what the sign is. Uh, in terms of the woman, and it's not the woman of Revelation uh, 17, Babylon. That That is not the woman, but we are going to be deceived that this sign of Revelation 12 will be connected to the Babylon religion, and likely through the Mary cult, with, it is currently within the Catholic Church. Um, I think it's going to get bigger as we get closer to the end time, because they describe her as the woman in Revelation 12. So I think they're going to conflate that. That's going to be part of the deception, but clearly this is the one who has the Messiah. And again, they're going to use that as an allegory that out of the Babylon religion comes Antichrist, because Antichrist takes power at the midpoint of the last seven years. Beforehand, Babylon has risen and permits this rise to power, and therefore that's going to be an allegory that the Babylon religion produces the Antichrist. And that's why in that story it describes that um, they're hidden away in the wilderness for 1,260 days, basically being protected from God from from the persecution? Yes. Yep. Okay. Exactly. So, um, and again, if I go back to what I said earlier in the show, let me add one more thing. I think the Bible is read linear. That means is, is from, you know, Genesis is the beginning and Revelation is the end of the book and everything sort of moves forward from there. And Revelation will read the same way. Okay. Okay. Now, for, what about for those that believe that um, in uh, a Christ consciousness... Um, that there is Christ in all of us and that when it's speaking of that being born that it's talking about a spirit being born inside of us how are we to identify that as a false spirit yeah we have to be very careful because we have you know in the Christian belief system that's sort of widely held that is you need to be born again um, to and and in 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 Jesus to to be saved and to accept them on faith and accept God on faith and accept the Holy Spirit on faith and Christ consciousness is not this Christ consciousness is about a spark of the divine in polytheism it is about an incarnation. Uh, it is about spirits that are sent to this world to help, in their belief system, humans on their path to godhood. So, Jesus wasn't an incarnation. Um, an incarnation is like uh, the incarnation of Vishnu, which Buddha was. This is a completely different concept than having the word uh, being implanted into uh, into Mary to become part human as a physical, uh, but still clearly the word from God who went back to them and to act as a sacrificial atonement. When we talk about incarnation and polytheism, this is like a reincarnation aspect, but specifically to a certain God or a certain set of Lost you for a second there, Gary. Lost you for a second there, buddy. Uh, we lost Gary. We're going to pick him back up. Uh, 
I'm, uh, sorry, buddy, the, the call dropped. Can you just pick back up where you left off? Whereabouts did it drop? I wasn't sure. I was... <laughs> Um, you I, was were, continu- you, I was continuing to speak, so I didn't realize it dropped. <laughs> um, it, you were speaking about how the Christ consciousness, um, Vishnu being an incarnation, and that the word uh, being put in Mary is not the same thing. Okay, so I'm not sure how far I got cut off, but where I'm going with this is that this this reincarnation or this incarnation of the god Vishnu who probably came along ten times and there might be more, but Buddha is part of that. And this is not the same concept, so hopefully I'm not being redundant here. This is an avatar concept as it comes out of Hinduism. And it spreads into Gnosticism and into Theosophy and into the New Age group because they're all based on the same, same religion. And so this incarnation is a possession type thing but it's not possession because that's what a demon does this is an angelic um, I would say a friendly type of arrangement a symbiotic relationship where the host is going to ask and be a willing partner to be an avatar as as they talk about and so that this Christ consciousness that they try and make us believe is the same as Jesus is not the same concept um, as 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 what Christians believe, and this is really really important to understand because as we get into prophecy and we understand who Antichrist is, he will be an incarnation. He won't be uh, the true Messiah. This is all based on counterfeits. Uh, creations is what I've talked about in terms of trying to do everything that God has, everything God has promised, and to counterfeit it and also to have their own realm. So what I'm talking about here is that when we see references to Antichrist in, in the New Testament... And we and he's talked about the son of perdition. We need to understand what perdition is, because perdition goes back to a whole series of words um, like uh, apolia, apolus, that is rooted in apollyon. Hmm. Okay, they're all part of the same set of Greek words, and so the son of perdition is going to be related to apollyon. Now, what's important to know about that is that. Antichrist receives what seems to be a fatal head wound, yep. but is going to rise and fake like the resurrection that, that Jesus had. Again, everything is a counterfeit. Then what we also know about the son of perdition, and as it's described particularly in the, in the King James Version in Revelation 17, is, is he is the one who once was, now is not. But will, but will be again and comes up out of the abyss and goes back to perdition. And then he's described as the son of perdition a couple verses before that. Just as he's described in Second Thessalonians as the son of perdition. So what we have going on here is, is before Antichrist takes power at the midpoint of the last seven years at the abomination, he is going to be possessed likely... And let me correct that comment. He is likely to be avatared after his head wound by Apollyon, who comes up out of, out of the abyss. And Apollyon is the same as as, as a bad. The destroyer. So, yeah. So what's what's going on is is you have now an incarnation of Antichrist, who is going to be. Um, Actually, a Baton and Apollyon avataring Antichrist and increasing his power. And what's really interesting about all of that is that if we look at Antichrist in Daniel 11, uh, he is going to honor a god of forces. And then if we look at where that word goes back to and connects from in, into Hebrew and then back into its root word, it connects back to... Azaz, which is forces, fortresses, and a whole series of words that sort of comes out of that root word. And you put the suffix on, like Michael has, the E-L, or Gabriel has, which is the E-L, and now that provides you Azazel. Yeah. 
And now you have this connection is, is Azazel the same as Abaddon and Apollyon? And mm-hmm. I think the answer is yes, because, you know, he is described in the book of Enoch, which isn't scripture, I understand that, but as being the leader of the, of the host of angels that rebelled. And a, and a lot of people say, well, but there's also Shemiazah. But if you look at the end of uh, of Shemiazah, it's got the Azah name of Azazel. And, and most people think that at some point in time, Azazel was split into two angels in the uh, book of Enoch, and uh, it's actually the same angel. But that's a, another rabbit hole, but just so that people understand there's a relationship there and there's an argument there. But I think when you look at the word Shemiazah, which doesn't end in El, and all the other angels in Enoch end in El, you have this interesting connection that I believe that, it, you know, they're the same angel. But anyways, Azazel is mentioned as well in the Bible, and that's who I think he is, because he's the leader of that host that is sentenced to the abyss and has ascribed all the sins of the antediluvian world. Absolutely. We also get Azazel that comes up in the Day of Atonement sacrifice as the second scapegoat, as it has in the King James Version, but if you go to other English translations or you go back to Hebrew, that second goat that is not being described as to what sins that goat is assigned for atonement for goes back to the word Azazel. And then when you go to Jeremiah 50 to 51, which is another one of those companion and dual prophecies that goes with Isaiah 13 and 14, and Ezekiel 28, and Isaiah 34, and a few other ones, um, then you have... In chapter 51, you have in verses 48 to 54, and it's also alluded to in the first part there where you have a destroying wind. Wind goes back to ruach, which is Hebrew for spirit, so it could be spirit or wind. But you get a clearer definition in 48 to 51 where destroyer which Azazel is described as, and Abaddon is described as, and Apollyon is described as, is this destroyer goes back to the word Abad, which is the root word for, guess who, Abad. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. The connections are definitely there. And it makes you wonder why they've removed the word Azazel and replaced it with scapegoat in a lot of versions of the Bible. Yeah, it, it, it makes no sense to me. Just as, how does Lucifer make it into Isaiah 14.12 in the King James Version Bible? It says Daystar and a few other things in, in some other translations, but the word hail L H E Y L E L is the Hebrew word. And Lucifer is a Latin word for Venus, and it's derived from Lux and Lucidius out of the Latin language. Um, and it's you know first used by um, Jerome, who writes the Vulgate Bible, and he's writing from Hebrew and in and original Greek text to create the Latin Bible for for the Roman Church. Um, and it seems that he either doesn't know what Hallel is or he's using something that he thinks might be the planet Venus which of course Satan and certainly in secret societies and Gnosticism Lucifer is equated with and that's the word Lucifer uh, for Venus but it's a, it's a Latin word substituted for a Hebrew word into the English translation without any explanation and I've got a handout on that if somebody uh, wants to go through that as well as uh, if somebody wants um, any of these commentaries on Isaiah 13 and 14, which is a seven-part series, or a uh, Satan one, which is, again, a six-part series, um, I can email you if you get a hold of me through my website or through Facebook. I can email you the Word document or give it to you in PDF form, or I can give you the Facebook link with uh, pictures, which, whichever you want. Um, so we have Hail L, which is probably the name of Satan. Um, because it's the only time it shows up in the Old Testament, and it's not used in, in any in any other time. All we get is Satan, which is more of a title, as an adversary, as the de- degraded level of who likely I think Hale L is. And a lot of people will say 
Hillel is the same as Hellel, but that's not quite true, and that's H-E-L-E-L. That is the definition for the figurative king of Babylon or the king of Assyria. And that's why you have a dual prophecy that's going on in Isaiah 13 and 14, Jeremiah 15 and 51, um, because, and other, and Ezekiel 28, because they're using Assyria and uh, the Assyrian and, ba- and the king of Babel for prophecies relative to that time, yeah. connected to the definition into prehistory and to prophecies going forward. Because nowhere does, does Assyria destroy Jerusalem as the Assyrian does in Old Testament prophecy. That kind of brings me into the next part. Um, you Not totally destroy Jerusalem, but attack Jerusalem. I should be care- more careful on my words on that. You speak about an alliance of beasts, and you speak about the fall of Babylon as kind of being a big part of things. Can you kind of talk about those a little bit? Well, again, when we get into Isaiah 13 and 14, we get... A whole host, so to speak, and host is, you know, one of those words for the angelic group. So don't use that loosely, um, because it's, it's, it's relative uh, that we have a whole host of beings that are kind of bizarre, kind of fantastic that are talked about. You know, things like, you know, satyrs and dragons and, um, you know, jackal-like beasts that howl. And these are all descriptions in the King James Version and to more euphonized versions in other English translations. But what's important is, is, is when you take that back to Hebrew and the greater understanding of all the other verses to deal with uh, the, these prophecies and definitions of these allegories is you find out that not only are these end-time prophecies where these beasts are being talked about, you know, and dragons in their palaces and, and dancing satyrs and things like that. This has got to do with the prophetic time of the end time with the destruction of Babylon first and then moving into Armageddon. So where you've got Isaiah 13 that is talking about Babylon's destruction. Uh, as you move into Isaiah 34, that is the end time, but you have the same sort of collection of beasts. And when we talk about dragons, these seem to be the watchers, mm-hmm. and or the sons of God that are in Genesis 6. And, you know, we do get watchers in the Bible uh, in Daniel 4, where it describes these watchers, and they're listed as watchers in, in the King James Bible. It might be just listed as a angel in other trans English translations, but they are called watchers, just as they're called watchers in Ezekiel. And these are the ones that are very powerful and governing angels over the earth. And these are thought to be seraphim angels. Seraphim, again, from Isaiah 6, where they are, uh, as a definition, a fiery serpent angel that work amongst the fiery stones, where I think the fiery comes from. The serpent aspect is, is that description of them. And their offspring, as these are the same ones, or part, not all, not all of the seraphims rebelled, because Daniel 4 clearly tells us that there were still loyal ones at, at that time, and still are, but the, the ones who rebelled and had sex with humans in Genesis 6 are the ones that go to the abyss, just as Azazel is likely seraphim as well, and that their offspring look like them. And they're described as serpents all around the world in prehistory and other religions as the kings and the demigods. Um, I won't go into great detail on that. I want to finish where I'm going um, from a biblical perspective here. But they look just like them. And so when we have that reference to the seed of the serpent in Genesis 3.15... This isn't uh, Satan having sex with Eve, as a lot of people believe, and that might be a possibility, but we just don't have a smoking gun, gun scripturally for that. And there's also verses that in the Bible that you know clearly say that uh, Cain was the son of Adam and Eve. So 
What I think Genesis 3.15 is referring to is Genesis 6, where you have clearly the sons of God, uh, who are angels, um, who go to human females and have the offspring, and they become the men of renown or the gibberim, as they're described. Now, gibberim doesn't have to always mean giant. It also means angels, and sometimes it's described as, as God. So let's not get... But most get too caught up in Gibberine, but the Nephilim part, which are the giants, is the Hebrew word, which goes back to um, H5303 Nephil, and again, you put the male plural on that, uh, you get Nephilim. And that's why, as we now, as we move that forward to what you began the show with, with Isaiah 14, uh, 25, uh, and 29, um, with the Assyrian and with the serpent's root, just to connect these sort of thoughts together, mm-hmm. is that out of, out of the serpent's root comes forth, you know, the cockatrice and the flying serpent. And I think what that is telling us from a prophetic basis in terms of the end time narrative that is working here uh, with the Assyrian, who is, is, is the Antichrist in Old Testament prophecy, that this is talking about that whole serpent ideology. Wow. Wow. That's intense. Um, and the way that it brings everything together is just... That's that's why I love the way uh, that you break it down and kind of put it together. Um, I don't think a lot of churches or a lot of people are doing it in this way, and that's what provides them a better understanding. Well, and, and yes, and that's why, you know, even on a, on a show like this, and I'm giving a fair bit of detail here, it's hard to go too far into the weeds and show all the detail. That's why, you know, the commentaries that I write are particularly detailed, and I will give all of the scripture I can and not without being too, uh, getting too far into the minutia of it. But I want to give Christians enough that they can rely on this as being something that's scriptural and scripturally supported all the way through. Uh, and so some people don't like to read them because they they have that much detail in it, but for the Christian who is on a... Uh, quest to, to, to learn more about this stuff. I think some of these commentaries are are very, very good. And just as I have extended commentaries on, um, you know, the case for the sons of God being angels, and I give a complete scriptural uh, case for that. Um, I also have one on why they're not Sethites, um, and do a, or the sons of God, as they're known also in the New Testament. I give a complete case on that. Not that everybody's going to agree, because um, you know we're all free to believe what we want, but I, you, you can literally make that case for these concepts and then start to understand the Bible in a way that will helpfully help us to understand prophecy better absolutely absolutely now uh, when we talk about the the fall of Babylon um, has this been something according to your opinion that has played out over and over throughout history and that's kind of what gives us the clues as to what will happen in in the now in the end time yeah it is and this fall of Babylon so to speak is akin to the fall of Satan and his sort of Babylon that he wants to raise his throne, you know, above the stars to be like God, right? So now if we roll that forward as the allegory that the falls, in plural, the falls of Babylon have, you get Babel as a classic story of what is going on within a 100 years of the flood. And you have an Antichrist figure in Nimrod who has complete sway over the descendants of Noah, and he imposes the Babel religion, which is why uh, you have the king of Babylon as part of that allegory, and why you have Babylon as the end-time religion. And what he's trying to do is create a tower to rise up into heaven so he can raise his throne into heaven and be like God. But in this case, it's not Satan. It's a Satan-inspired plot and fallen angel-inspired plot to have humans continue to do this. Mm -hmm. 
basis, we get the empires that Daniel talks about. And, of course, the king of uh, Babel and Nebuchadnezzar, he does exactly this. And he's trying to raise his thrown into heaven and he's actually punished for seven years by God to bring some humility to him and uh, you also have uh, like the Assyria uh, before Babylon who is going to try and ransack Jerusalem as well as, as Antichrist will in the end time and of course God sends the angel of the Lord and, and, and moves that back and so when we look at what the Babylon religion is and does, it is the religion of Babel. It is the religion, the antediluvian mysticism before the flood that is restarted by Nimrod and who the Freemasons believe is Hermes uh, because he brings the religion and brings the knowledge to Nimrod to create Babel City and to create the Babel Tower from a polytheist perspective. But Enoch, son of Cain, not Enoch, son of Jared, because there's two Enochs in Genesis, he is the one who begins mysticism or polytheism. This is based, again, on polytheist records, and he's called by many different names around the world. I'll stick with the Freemasons because that's who I'm using, and they are the Gnostic religion, which is theosophy and also New Age in the West. Uh, and they believe that he created the mystical religion and the secret societies uh, from the knowledge uh, Adam learned in Eden from God, who passed it down to Cain, but they pervert the knowledge, and then this all meshes with the illicit knowledge of angels in Genesis 6 um, to totally corrupt the antediluvian world and in partnership with the creation of the Nephilim. Now, so this religion crosses the flood and it re-pops up at, at Babel to do a, a quick summary of this. So this is the same religion of the first apocalypse. So it should be, if it's going to be like the days of Noah and expanding it to more than just violence because they corrupted the whole world, genomes, animals, everything. And I know that's another rabbit trail. we maybe come back to that a little bit later in the show if you'd like, John. Okay. But... What the point I'm making is is that it needs to be the same religion of the first apocalypse because nothing is new under the sun. And so when we understand that, and Jesus is talking about it's going to be like the days of Noah, and we look at this in that larger context, then it's appropriate that the religion that crosses the flood at Babel, that is the religion of all the empires that Daniel talks about, is the end-time religion called Babylon, um, because it's the same root religion that is sponsored by Satan. Wow. Wow. So, being you're saying that it being connected to the Masons and the Gnostics and the New Age, uh, that would all be considered Babylon religion? It is, because what Gnosticism is doing, and in my book I call it Global Gnosticism, is they're trying to reunite all of the ancient religions under one universal religion in the end time. Now, to be able to do that, they also have to make sure that they can bring along the Jewish people, and obviously the Muslims, and as much of the Christians as they can get. I don't think they're going to be totally successful, but that's also why I think to fool the Jewish people, Antichrist is also going to have to be have some sort of Jewish pedigree to them along with Nephilim pedigree, which is part of the serpent seed and the super, serpent's root of the end time. So, uh, this Gnostic religion is going to be this umbrella religion. And it's going to be centered in, in Rome, um, just as Babylon in the New Testament, when you take that back to Greek, it's also was known and, and defined in part, not only as the ancient Babylon and the ancient Babylon Empire, but also as an allegory for Rome, because during the time of the Romans, if you spoke poorly about the Roman Empire, they, they'd they execute you, so they used an allegory. Uh, the Essenes called that, and polytheists would call that a pesher argument used by Jewish people, but um, it's known on both sides, whether it's polytheism or monotheism, that that was an allegory for Rome. So they, they need to be able to take this religion and take over the Roman Catholic Church for the end time, and to engulf all of Christianity and to bring down Christianity to a point where they can rebuild it up 
underneath this umbrella religion, and one would presume you have to do the same thing for the Muslims and for um, the uh, uh, the Jewish people. And the best way to do that is to discredit the true Messiah, the true Word of God, the true Son of God, that Jesus was just an allegory and just a maybe an incarnation, and his resurrection is an allegory. I think they'll go with he's an incarnation, uh, that he was just another prophet like Buddha, because that's what they teach in those religions. Yep. And that they will say that just as Jesus gave the sign uh, to that wicked generation that he came to in, in the land of Judah, that would be the sign of Jonah. They now are saying Jonah is a parable. It didn't happen. It's a fable. It's a fairy tale. And that if Jesus' sign was a, a parable, so is his resurrection. And then they're going to try and convince us with false evidence that Jesus survived off the cross and did, did not die on the cross and was resurrected. So, And as Paul said, our whole faith stands on that. So they need to attack it right at the most important piece of Christianity, but not totally destroy it. So they'll keep Jesus as an incarnation of Vishnu or some other uh, god or angel as one of those people sent like Buddha, uh, like uh, Zoroaster, like Hermes, uh, and on and on and on, Confucius, and all these other names that they'll present as being that incarnation, that Christ consciousness to help humans evolve and find the way and the path to godhood but that way is not the way of jesus as jesus talked about that is the way of cain that is the way of son's religion uh that was created in the antediluvian epoch so i think all of this is 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 going to be working through this global Gnosticism that will become the end time religion that makes the way for Antichrist. Because when we look into Daniel, you have this this uh, seven year covenant that's created. And so uh, Antichrist doesn't come along until the new world order is put in place. And the new world order is going to require the religion as the glue to put this in place. And then the religion will be become um, very much rich off of this arrangement because it's also a commercial contract. And as the conspirators talk about in their writings, they're going to take a tribute or like a value-added tax uh, portion off of every transaction that's going to take place um, in the not-so-distant future. So when you hear value-added taxes, and we have that in Canada called the GST, be very, very wary because this is where that is going. So that Babylon is going to grow very rich. And then this world empire of ten groups of nations or ten trading blocks or ten spheres of influence uh, – Nations, uh, spheres of influence, like Russia would have, like over the old sort of Soviet bloc influence, that might be one of the groups, or NAFTA as a free trade agreement. Um, they are going to grow jealous of Babylon, and that's why they will conspire with the rising Antichrist who negotiates this covenant to overthrow Babylon, because they grow jealous of her, as it's described in, again, Revelation 17. Do you believe that, um, like like most, that the United States is Babylon? Uh, no, I can, and I, I take criticism from a lot of people for this, um, but every because there's a lot of different views. No, I don't believe the United States is Babylon. I think they are going to be part of the world government. I think they're a very very important part of the end time, um, but they're not Babylon. And uh, what we do know about Babylon is it is a city as opposed to a complete country because it's described as a city in, in Revelations. We do know it's a religion um, because of the uh, adultery and abomination allegories. Um, and we do know that it's a religion that is going to have a Christian veneer because it has two horns uh, like a lamb that speaks like a dragon. So it has that veneer of, of that Christian religion uh, and the religion of Jesus, but it is a religion of Antichrist and the religion of Satan and is going to bring about their false messiah for the end time and the, and the counterfeit 
um, new age that they're going to be offering. And so, no, I don't think United States is. And a lot of people will say, well, it could be talking about New York City. Fair enough. But there's only one city famous for being on seven hills or seven mountains, and that's Rome. And it's the old, old city. So it's going to be an ancient city. Now, if somebody wanted to make an argument, well, is Rome really ancient enough, or is it the old city of Babylon? And not an allegory for Rome. I suppose that's that's possible, um, but it has to be rebuilt, and it's going to take a significant uh, rebuilding to to create that city. And if it's a new city, like some people are talking about on the internet today, then it can't be the old old city. So when I talk about uh, and, and Babylon is going to be destroyed, and I don't think from prophecy, particularly in, in, in Isaiah, um, I don't believe it's going to be totally destroyed. It's going to be uh, um, hurt uh, at the time of the trumpets, but it's not going to be totally destroyed. And Babylon is totally destroyed. So for a whole host of reasons that if you put all of the related prophecies together, then... Uh, it's going to make sense, or it's not going to make sense, in terms of uh, when it tends not to make sense, what somebody is trying to do is overlay a preconceived concept to try and have Scripture fit into it, instead of letting Scripture read for itself and see what Jesus has to say on, on, on these subjects. So you would lean more towards, like, the Vatican? Yeah, it's it's it's... It's going to be a commercial business, it's going to be a city, and it's going to be an organization, and it's going to have power and influence as she rides this ten-nation empire, but I would lean heavily towards Rome. I'm certainly open to other possibilities, but to me, all roads lead to, to, lead to Rome, and you already have what they call a uh, universal church there, which is you know the definition for Catholicism. And you already have a city-state there with the Vatican. So you don't have to create those separate entities or anything up. You just have to take over and then find a way through uh, false prophets and cataclysms to have everybody convert to that religion. And to a religion that is going back to to more polytheist roots, so you have to have a complete internal takeover, even more so than we have today, if that is possible. And unfortunately, it is to totally uh, turn Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, into a polytheist religion, and be prepared to deny Jesus's resurrection. Wow! Wow! Uh, and you may look to that, and you should look maybe towards that Mary cult to do that. You know, uh, most people are familiar with uh, Fatima or Lourdes, um, and some people even may be familiar with um, Mary visions that came along to um, uh, Joan of Arc, um, which uh, was trying to put you know a change on the French throne and gain freedom from from the English. But these Mary apparitions have a history uh, that is very closely associated with Gnosticism. And I think this is what is going on with the Mary movement in, in the Catholic Church today. And in Medjugorje, which is a very, very important one to keep in mind, this uh, is an apparition that happens in the 90s. And Mary is only seen by a few children who are initiated into the commission that they're going to uh, go forward with at a specific time that they've kept secret. And it is an extension of the other prophecies through the Mary apparitions is, is part of their mission. And what they did tell us, though, is, is when they're ready, they will come out um, and make 10 predictions that if the world doesn't convert to the one true religion as they're going to be promoting, it will destroy itself or be destroyed from the face of the earth and God will punish the earth. And so they will issue uh, a series of 10 with, with those catastrophes getting larger every time. And if this is true... 
in terms of not from what they've said, but if it's true in doing what they say they're going to do, I think this is how we have the use of cataclysms and the takeover of the Roman Church to bring about some of those really sort of fantastic claims I was making just a few minutes ago. Um, but in anything in prophecy, what we have to understand is it doesn't always happen the way people think it's going to happen. So you have to be open to the fact that um, it becomes more clear after the fact than before. So although I lean towards Bab- uh, Babylon being Rome in a, in a significant way, um, not I do not in a dogmatic way say that it has to be or try and stake you know uh, anything because I'm not a prophet. Um, and I don't make uh, prophecies. Um, I'm only trying to understand what's in what's in the Bible as what is written in the Bible, and try and make that more clear for people, and give them a scriptural argument for why we need to understand that. And when we talk about that Mary cult, as I said earlier in the show, they describe this Mary vision as being the Lady in Revelation 12, the exact same description, and. In this belief system that is in that Gnostic cult is is that they adopt this as well and they overlay these visions of Mary as being the mother of God whom they call Isis or her many names in the different pantheons that are around the world whether or not it's, it's Ishtar or Ashtaroth and on and on and on Gaia. They're all the same goddess out of the, the same um, ancient unified religion I was referring to that was started by Enoch, son of Cain. Wow. And I tell you this, in the, in the Gnostic, uh, you know, beliefs, they put uh, a lot of um, significance and importance on the female aspect um, of divinity um, and basically claim that that's what's been hidden from us. And Yeah, and I expect we're going to see a lot more of that as we approach the end time. And uh, to and even to the fact that in certain gospels in in the Gnostic um, set of gospels, you have Sophia, who is said to be the one who creates seven angels, and seven angels is one of those sort of archetypical numbers that's in the ruling watcher class of the higher um, antediluvian world. And one of those angels is they call and known by two different names um, in different Gospels, but one is Ialda Boath, and the other one is Demarage, yeah. whom they say is the God of the Bible. Yahweh. Right? They say so, that Yalda Boath Yahweh. is Yahweh. So, yeah. yeah. So not only do they have to bring Jesus down to prophet status, they need to bring the God Most High down to being just like another one, a number of other angels, including Satan, and no more powerful than Satan. Which is, again, exactly what the Gnostics and the secret societies teach, is that Adonai, as they like to call him, is the equal of Lucifer, which they begrudgingly admit, and that that is where that dualism of that Gnostic and polyistic um, religion is is sort of constituted in that you have the yin and the yang, um, good versus evil, that is always in balance and at constant uh, odds with each other that will go on for eternity, but that doesn't mean you can't live in a separate realm. You just have to continually fight against it, and that's what they're going to pitch in the end time, that we will have to, that humans will have to fight for their freedom against the evil god of the universe if they want to have their freedom away from oppression. Wow. Wow. That's intense. Um, That completely describes uh, how they talk about the archons or created that they're basically, they they feed off of our spiritual energy and that Yaldabaoth is is Yahweh um, and that uh, basically we're we're brighter than, than them in our original creation that they are the ones who have created this world and ain't that the whole trick, though, that Satan wants to, to do, is to deceive us into him being God? Absolutely, it is, or an equal to God, right? Yeah, exactly. So if he, if he created everything, then that makes him God, right? Yeah, and, and so what they teach is, is that um, 
Lucifer, as I like to call him, I like Hail El or Satan better, um, is, is not necessarily a creator god, but he sorted out and fixed the mess that Ialdabaoth, uh, Demerij, Yahweh, the god of the Bible, made a mess of. So Satan is the good god uh, looking after humankind and cleaning up after God and fixing up his messes, and he'll do that for humans and let us live away from the oppression of, of God and his priests and the rules that they're trying to impose. That's basically their pitch and negativity, and they back that up by saying that God is the evil God of the Bible, and it's demonstrated by his evil acts, like the flood, like destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, um, like uh, wiping out people in the Exodus, uh, you know, the wars of the Exodus to take the covenant land, and, uh, you know, totally manipulating what the Bible actually says to, to make their point. But that's what they're going to do in the end time. There's going to be this all-out propaganda war on our God, on our, on our Messiah, on our Redeemer, and on our Scripture, and turn it into an allegorical-based interpretation of the Bible, because they look at it as a fairy tale that you need to be enlightened and illuminated as an adept in the polytheist religions and secret societies so that you can understand the true meaning that's underneath the, the fairy tale superficial layer, um, which is the mysteries that they're going to set forward. So they're going to create an extraordinarily convincing case for people who aren't extraordinarily sound in what the Bible says. And Jesus warns us about this in Matthew and in Mark where it says that even the elect will be deceived if that were possible. So that's the size of the deception and the propaganda and the attacks spiritually that are coming in the end time. And so when you talked about this alliance, uh, and I didn't sort of talk about that in a greater detail, the end time is filled with, I think, uh, some sort of return of Nephilim, whether or not it's their descendants, or it is DNA manipulation to create superhumans, or it's transhumanism, or it's cloning, or whatever the avenue, I think they're going to create some sort of bodies for these Nephilim demon spirits, and by the way, I have a biblical case for demons in the Bible, to, um, if somebody wants it, get a hold of me, to possess these bodies because they're like Jesus describes them as thirsting for a body, even though it's and they take over a human, it's not this avatar concept that I talked about. There's, you know, it distorts the body. There's a war going on within the body. The facial features change. Everything changes. I think they need a body that's more like a clone body or a robotic body or something like that because they need, as Jesus says, so, you know, so they thirst for these bodies because that's the only way they can interact with the world. And I think they're going to be part of leading the armies uh, in the several, in the many wars of the uh, last seven years. And I think we see that coming out of Revelation 9 and the 200 million man war, which is the Joel 1 and 2 war, not to be confused with Armageddon that starts in Joel 3, and it's the same as the Gog War. That's another rabbit hole to go down to. We can maybe come back to that if you like. But when we talk about this alliance of dragons which is like a seraphim angel, or the satyrs that we're talking about, which is a devil god, which is how gods like Azazel uh, are described, or um, Pan, or Bacchus, uh, or Cern, or Sununus, and all of these, and Baphomet, and all these other descriptions of, of these goats, individual gods, um, it goes back to the word sa'ir in Hebrew, and it's used twice uh, for satyr gods, and they're called devil gods in two applications in scripture, and you take that back, goes back to satyr, uh, as the English transliteration is, which shows up in Isaiah 13 and Isaiah 34. And so you have seraphim angels, you have degraded gods, you have uh, jackal-like uh, beasts, which sort of also brings up the god of, uh, of Egypt, that's the, that's the jackal god, uh, and I wonder whether or not there's a connection there, uh, and you have... Um, uh, 
these beasts being united with the use of the word gibberim in many of these applications as well in prophecies, that you have this alliance of demons and fallen angels and rebellious humans that are going to make this final stand against God in the end time. Wow. Wow. So basically the trick is to convince the world that God is not God, that he's in fact... Lucifer, the great architect, um, or some variation of that, and or that Lucifer's the good guy who tried to free us from God, and using this alliance to fight against him, and do you think that's what brings about the destruction of everything? Oh, there's, there's no doubt that if you look at the timing of the bull, the wrath bulls, you know, that happens after the trumpets. And that happens after the abomination with Antichrist um, being crowned the king of Jerusalem in the temple to become, you know, a dictator of the world. It happens after he's been avatared by um, Abad Napoleon as Azel. It happens after Revelation 12, where you have the angels being uh, thrown out of heaven after the war in heaven, and they're part of the end time. And it happens after the opening of the abyss uh, with Abaddon and Apollyon and the scorpion beings that are coming out behind them, which also includes the 200 million man war, which is the Gog War. And so you also have, you know, in Joel and in Ezekiel, the use of, again, mighty ones, uh, which goes back in those applications to Gibrim again, just as in, in Ezekiel 39.11, you have this interesting term called passengers uh, and or travelers to, in other translations, which goes back to the... Hebrew word a bar five six seven four as I recall and that means um, bringing over or crossing over from the other side and generally used in in that application um, for coming over from Hades uh, or from he- uh, uh, the abyss or from portions of the underworld and what's important about that is is the Raphaim which are post diluvium Nephilim that are described in the Bible in the Ugaritic texts um, they're described as not only as, as Raphaim but also as the spirits that cross over on a regular basis and so when I talked earlier about this alliance and this crossing over um, as being part of this alliance and that matching that up with uh, possessing clones or, or whatever and leading in the wars and you understand that Joel 1-2, Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Revelation 9 are the same war and then all of this is leading to the destruction of Babylon and then to the uh, Armageddon battle and that is in the last three and a half years yes is the simple answer <laughs> And now, when do you believe the the rapture will take place, if at all? Gary? Sorry about sorry about that. I had my mic on for a second. Uh, didn't realize it. Um, I, I, I do want to qual. I do believe in the rapture, and I do want to qualify. Um, that um, I understand this is one of those issues that divides um, Christianity and I don't want to do that in any sort of, sort of manner and I do respect other people's positions on it but from my research um, and doing all the things that I talked about before uh, including all of the passages referring to what Jesus says, says on the subject and looking at things in a linear basis and looking at how they correlate with other prophetic passages with markers like trumpets and banners and things like that is I look towards a slightly after the midpoint of the last seven years for Jesus come first for rapture Second for Exodus, of not only the people who are fleeing from Jerusalem uh, into the wilderness, but the people of Judah all around the world, Mm -hmm. and an awakening Israel of the lost tribes who will be called by name and remember who they are in the end time and who will stand up against Antichrist and Babylon 
for a limited amount of time against Babylon and put into prisons. Jesus is the one who comes in the year of the Lord's favor to free them and lead them in Exodus along with the seven other shepherds um, who I think Elijah will also be part of to lead them back to the land of the covenant and wait out the Armageddon war in preparation for the millennium. And and that being when when you believe then he would return with the cloud of witnesses to destroy them. Yeah, if yeah, you're referring to Revelation 19. So after Exodus, after rapture, and after the bull wraths have come out, Jesus will return um, with the clouds of heaven and the armies of heaven, uh, of whomever. All of that is included there, um, and does battle at Armageddon, and then we move into the thousand year reign, and Satan is put into the abyss which he had not previously been put into and then one presumes just as um you know we're told in in jude and we're told in second peter and in isaiah 26 20 to 24 that these rebellious angels who were in the abyss and and likely the rest of the fallen angels who weren't in in the abyss um, are going to be sent to the lake of fire. And then Satan goes to the lake of fire after the thousand years and after the second Magog War. And again, I know a lot of people think that the Magog War is only at the end of the millennium. And I'm here to say that if, if you read Ezekiel 38 and 39, it says a couple of times these are the last days, um, these are the latter times, which all refer to the end time. And in Ezekiel 39, God uh, and Jesus do, uh, or God sends Jesus, as we just talked about, and he is going to start the Exodus. So if you read both of those two chapters together, you're going to find that it's in the end times, and second Exodus is overlaid in there. Just as you go back into Ezekiel 37, you have also this interesting prophecy of the dry bones being risen up, which again, I do not believe is an allegory, and I think it's going to be at the time when Jesus comes. And then you go read further on into Ezekiel 37, and you're going to see another reference to the Exodus. And all of the second Exodus prophecies are put in the end time. Wow. Wow. Now, for, for those out there that would say, you know, um, what, what has you so convinced that Jesus is the Messiah? He is who he says he is. What would you say to them? Gary? I think just as Jesus is talking about in John 10, uh, when the Pharisees are accusing him of blasphemy in terms of calling himself the Son of God and raising himself up to be God, um, Jesus basically makes his case in in a couple of ways. And what he says is is that, you know, in Psalms 82, and he testifies to the veracity of calling uh, the sons of God, sons of the Most High, which is the same. And again, I have a handout on that that I mentioned earlier. If people want that, that that we'll explain this in detail. Um, are the gods, the sons of the Most High in Psalms 82, are the gods. And if God uh, said that, then it is absolutely true, just as he is the son of God. So he is the son of God, higher than any of the other angels. And his acts, that they should believe not only in what he says, but in what he does as credentials for who he was and i look at what he said what he what he did and match that up with prophecy and what prophecy said he would say and do and then look at the magnitude of the astonishing clarity inexplicable understanding 
uh, mystifying in in the depth of the knowledge and uh, and how fast he drills into the points in a way that nobody has ever done can only come from being the word of god himself absolutely absolutely i agree um i i believe he is who he is and um i've heard you refer to him also as the high priest of the order of mcheseldeck now where does mcheseldeck come from well, that's a very good question. Where does uh, Melchizedek come from? Um, because it says in Hebrews that he has no genealogy. Okay. He has no mother and has no father, but yet in Genesis 14, after the war against giants, um, and after Abraham saves Lot from the Mesopotamian kings with his his uh, commandos um, or his fighting men um, that he meets with the priest of Jerusalem and his name is Melchizedek um, and yet we're not given a lineage for him coming out of the table of nations um, the Jebusites at that time were living in Jerusalem and Jebusites are Canaanites um, and so I, some people think he was Shem, but again, we have no genealogy and Hebrews clearly says, uh, that he has no genealogy and no mother or father. I think what we're seeing in, um, as Melchizedek is Jesus as the word at that point in time manifesting himself as Melchizedek for Abraham and is, you know, about to invest in Abraham to create uh, Israel, who will create Judah, who will end up, you know, presenting the tribe that is going to produce the word being implanted into a descendant of David, David through Mary, which is the word of God who becomes Jesus. Um, he's about to bless him for that. And that this order that Jesus is going to take over um, is, he has the right to do it as Hebrews is talking about because he has never sinned and he has overcome and he has resurrected and he can become a priest forever in the, the lineage of Melk. Melchizedek, which means it should be in his own lineage. That's why I also think that uh, it's another reference to, to him being one of the same. And that if we look at in uh, the Psalms in, in 110, um, he is prophesied to be the one who sits at the right hand of God until the end time and, and as being a priest forever and like Met Melchizedek, and that God swears Jesus is a priest forever after that order, and anointed by God, uh, just as it says in Hebrews 7, that he's going to be anointed by the oath by God. And what's all important about this is, is it goes back to where we kind of started with the show, is that originally you had Satan, who I think is Halal, who is both seraphim and cherubim, and was also a priest before God. And so you have this earthly uh, Levite order of priests, and you have the Melchizedek order uh, that seemingly is uh, the Levite priests are going to maintain until Jesus comes to take it over. Um, and this is all part of the grand plan to totally account for and replace all aspects of what took place with the angelic rebellion. This time, Jesus is the priest before God forever, replacing the priestly aspects that Satan with his nine jewels and his seraphim uh, credentials uh, was before. Wow. Wow. And he's he's in a, he's higher than than the rank that that Satan attained. He uh, oh way higher, way higher, yes. And 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 that is why um, whenever you know the the fight happens in heaven and the the serpent is cast down, he's not strong enough. Um, how is Micah L connected to to Jesus? 
Well, I think you have, well, I, I, I'm, he's obviously a, an archangel of extraordinary power and probably, you know, one of the seven that are, are around God. And so for Michael to be able to take on other angels and Satan in particular, either Satan has been degraded in his power and Michael and other angels raised, uh, or that couldn't happen. So I think probably both um, has taken place, um, but I don't think that Michael is Jesus by any stretch of the imaginations. I think they're clearly two different individuals, and I, I, I would also make the case that he might be the restrainer. And for people who don't know who the restrainer is, that is the force that has to be taken away until the end times can come about. And we look at Michael in the book of Daniel, and he has talked about as fighting the king of Persia and is the only one who fights against the king of Persia. And it's, they're talking about Persia of that time because that's the time um, that is actually happening at that time as Daniel is recording it. And these are part of the world empires, which the last end time empire extends out of. And so this is the angel that fights against the oppression of Antichrist and the oppression of these Nephilim empires that will be permitted to take power once the restrainer is removed. So the restrainer is either Michael or the Holy Spirit, which God's, which, who Jesus sent to replace him after he left, after his resurrection, and after being with uh, the disciples for a short period of time after the uh, resurrection. So that, that's who I think is, is uh, uh, Michael is, and different than Jesus, and why... Um, Michael is stronger than Satan is today. And for people who are wanting to check the references on that genealogy uh, that I had mentioned earlier, um, go to Hebrews uh, 7.3. Uh, that's where you'll find that reference on no genealogy. Yes. Man, uh, I've had, i got so many uh, questions for you. I don't, I don't know how long you, uh, you, you plan on hanging on here. Um if you would, you, could you expound on, you was talking about as in the days of Noah and um, the corruption of genes and things of that nature. Could you kind of go back to that for a moment and just speak on that uh, of, of, the, of the genealogy? Oh. Now T-Mobile has unlimited for the rest of us and it starts as low as 30 bucks per line for four lines. So if you want your family to take 800 vacation selfies to share with the world, now you can. Get unlimited for everyone now starting as low as 30 bucks per line for four lines from T-Mobile. Call 1-800-T-MOBILE or visit a store today. During congestion, users on this plan may notice speeds lower than other users and further reduction if using more than 50 gigs per month. Video streams at 480p with auto pay, plus taxes and fees, unlimited data while on our network. Introducing the amazing iPhone XS you'll love on T-Mobile, the most loved and wireless. It's the perfect way to stay connected to those you heart most, like your BFF. Hello? Hey. Hey. Just got my iPhone XS. Well, look at you. Welcome to the big screens. So, you got my selfie? Yeah, like the second you sent it. Selfie portrait mode. I know. I totally like long tap liked it. Oh, cool. So, my hair looked... Like straight fire. What? What? What about my Memoji? Doesn't it look like... Like you're wearing the same glasses as mine? Oopsie. Sorry. Fall in love with iPhone XS on T-Mobile, the most loved and wireless, and share whatever you want, whenever you want, with those you heart most. And right now, you'll love our best offers ever on iPhone XS. What? Visit a T-Mobile store or call 1-800-T-MOBILE today. Um, Antichrist pedigree. I can talk about that if that's what okay. you're referring to yes. in ancient days. Okay, yes. Okay, um, or the corruption of pedigree uh, uh, genealogies that they're going to talk about with Jesus, because it's kind of all part of the same sort of subject. So when it talks about in the Bible, if they're talking about uh, in the old times or in the old, old times, um, those are all references uh, on like a 99.9% .9 rule in the Old Testament uh, for before the flood. 
And so if you understand that, it starts to make sense, you know, and, you know, let's say, you know, off the top of my head, a good example might be in Deuteronomy 32, 7 to 8, for example, and it's talking about these old, old times and um, the times of their ancestors and before. And I'll tell you about these old, old times when um, God divided the nations and their allotments and the allotments of the sons of Israel. What's interesting about that translation, and that's King James Bible and most ones, um, it should probably be translated as not sons of Israel, but the sons of God, because in the Masoretic text, which they leaned heavily on in the King James Version translation, it actually says in Hebrew, sons of God, not um, sons of Israel. Um, and I think that's been... I'm um, not sure why that is inexplicably saying Israel, because Israel wasn't before the flood and wasn't around at that time when the, you know, even at the time of Babel where you have the 70 nations coming out, um, that for an allotment of nations after the flood or the allotments of the descendants of Adam, as it says, which is clearly before the flood. So that would be one example of understanding it as, as the ancient times. And it says ancient times that's also a uh, word that is referenced to prehistory. Now, in terms of the corruption... Uh, Go ahead. So when we talk about pedigrees and corruptions of pedigrees as we approach into the end time, you know, we need to look at two different aspects of these pedigrees. The first one is uh, with uh, Jesus, because as I talked about, that they're going to allege and provide false evidence of Jesus uh, not dying on the cross. Um, this is a clearly a Gnostic belief. It is one of those sort of constitutive aspects that they use to not dismiss Jesus historically, uh, but to accept him as a prophet, but a mortal prophet. And in their belief system, and they say they have the records and the genealogies to prove this, uh, I believe they're false, um, but they're old, and it's been well plotted for a long time because this is a 6,000-year plot. The last 2,000 years is just the modern wedge of the conspiracy that I talk about in my book. So if they're going to show that Jesus, uh, or at least try and convince people, and most people around the world will believe this lie, um, because they'll have been well prepared for it, is that Jesus survived the cross, and he meets up with Mary Magdalene, who they call the, uh, the, the disciple that Jesus loved, and they actually married, and they produced depending on which version, two or three or other children as well, but typically the average is three, which the third one, which by the name is Josephus, as they name him, goes on to continue the lineage that marries into the Camelot dynasties um, of Wales. And you've heard about this in the Da Vinci Code. So this is where this is, that may have been a fiction, but they were basing it on their beliefs. And they say they have the genealogies on this. And that Joseph of Arimathea, who they also call James, uh, brother of Jesus, takes Josephus uh, to uh, Glastonbury, and then um, he will intermarry into the, the Celtic dynasties. And at the time of Aragon and Aminabad of the Merovingian dynasty, they'll allege, or something similar to this, that with that wedding and with the descendancy of Aragon uh, going back to Josephus, going back to Jesus, now marries into the Merovingian dynasty. And so these bloodlines that I talk extensively about in my book are going to lead through the Merovingian dynasty, um, complete with uh, Dagobert, who is the last recorded Merovingian, who is said in the occult circles to be the descendant of Godfrey de Bouillon, uh, de Payon, and uh, the, the folk of Anjou, who are all members of the original forming uh, council of the Knights Templar. And so this is the secret that they're keeping. And so they say they have all of these genealogies. And just as that was the excuse for them to dig at Jerusalem for these genealogies uh, that they believe the Essenes had kept. And the Essenes are part of this occult sort of web that they're going to, to weave in the end time. So they're going to pre present a false pedigree of... Uh, 
of uh, descendancy for Antichrist back to Jesus and Mary Magdalene. They will also present pedigrees probably independent that will take Jesus back to David, so at least they can prove uh, his descendancy back to David and to King Saul. And this is important because to prove to have the Jewish people believe in the false Messiah, they're going to have to show some sort of pedigree of, of Jewish lineage, and this is going to be part of that deception. And they're also going to show the bloodlines back to the Nephilim, which is the serpent seed and the serpent's root that we started the show off with. And so this is all important for the pedigree, which is a lot of it's going to be false, and maybe even the pedigree all the way back to the Nephilim is false. But they're going to use it because all of the royal families around the world keep their genealogies and pedigree. So it's going to come with mountains of other parallel lineages from Nephilim that's going to rush in to support it. And so when you have uh, the Antichrist who is going to present these genealogies both uh, on the side back to Nephilim and back to Jesus. Um, it is this, these are these are the corruptions of the genealogies I'm talking about, and specifically the one for uh, taking him back to Jesus. The other ones may be partially true, partially not. I mean, we won't know, but I believe they're going to take that back. But they're also going to make that connection back to being a descendant of the fallen angels as a Nephilim because he's called son of perdition, who we took about earlier, talked about earlier as being connected, that word back to Greek, to a series of words that include Apollyon as it appears in Revelation 9, which is the same as Abaddon, which is the same as Azazel that we talked about earlier in the show as well. Wow, wow. Basically connecting everything, bringing it full circle. Yeah, and overwhelming the population with ancient records, which are, are you, know, you know, certainly uh, are going to at least be partially... Um, false. Um, and again, I don't know whether I even believe that they have true genealogies back to the Nephilim, but that's how the royal families all around the world um, take their genealogies back and they all keep them. So there may be something to that. Yeah, they, they, they all believe that they're descendants of the Nephilim and that's what gives them their right to, to rule. Their divine right to rule, as King James uh, asserted. Um, so this has been in place since antiquities because they are there at the anointing of God and as the priest of God. That's where the Fisher King concept comes from, where the priest king concept also comes from, as it comes out of polytheism. So yes, they uh, uh, they are there to to. Uh, to represent the gods of, of the ancient world, so to speak. Wow. Wow. Now, is there anything else you would like to, to touch base on before uh, we end tonight's broadcast? Um, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good question, and I know there's a lot of areas where we've touched on that we, could, we didn't really dig um, deep into, but they're all... Uh, fairly deep subjects. Um, so if somebody wanted to, if you said, well, you know, what were you talking about with the scenes because I didn't talk about them very much. If you refer to it by subject, I'll send you that Facebook link and or um, the Word document, whichever you prefer, or those scorpion beasts that we talked about out of Revelation 9 and on and on and on with some of the things I just sort of um, rushed through. Um, but I also wanted just to touch base on this pedigree just a little bit more in terms of underlining some of their connections. And if you remember, in that lineage of pedigree that I was talking about, Antichrist is not only going to mix in Nephilim, but also uh, Jesus and also David. I also said King Saul. Um, and what they believe is, is that uh, the descendants of Dagobert who take their... Uh, who started the Knights Templar, uh, that the Merovingians believe they have Benjamite bloodlines mixed in with them. That come through Sicambium Franks on the one side, which I explain in my book, 
and I don't really have time to go through here, and also through who they believe Mary Magdalene was of royal bloodline coming out of King Saul's lineage and a priestess in in in, in a polytheist, a Senic, uh, uh, Kabbalistic type religion. But that's their belief. That's not my belief. That's what they're going to assert. But what's important about this is that I mentioned they, that the Knights Templar, including de Bollion, de Payan, and Anjou, were excavating for genealogies and treasures at the foot of the temple. And Jerusalem was taken and protected by the Crusades and the Templars, so losing it in 1188 is, is, is just something that's almost like a crushing blow. It actually causes a split within the organization. And that's all because they believe that in Joshua, that they are the rightful inheritors of the time of the Exodus when Joshua awards Jerusalem to the Benjamites. And so in 1118, for the first time, we have a crowning of the king of Jerusalem. And as none other than the brother of Godfrey de Bouillon. And the second successor is going to be an Anjou. And this is going to be a title that now goes down through these royal bloodlines that you'll see uh, carried through many different dynasties of the Habsburgs to, through the descendants of, of Anjou and de Payon with uh, King René of the Lorraine region, which, which is where the double cross of Lorraine comes from for the two bloodlines of Jesus and of Nephilim that, that, that they portray. And that they are the in in the current and that they are the rightful inheritors of Jerusalem and today it's held by the King of Spain. So watch for that King of Jerusalem title to match up with whether or not it's the King of Spain or whatever person is going to pass on to and perhaps another dynasty to receive it because it it does move around from uh, monarch to monarch, as, as I gave a few examples of in, in in the past. And what's important about that is is that they believe and this underscores the pedigree, is that at the abomination in the temple, in Jerusalem, is that Antichrist will accept his rightful inheritance through the bloodlines or the pedigree as the king of Jerusalem. Wow. Wow. Wow, that's insane. I mean... The, the the web of sedition and reach is just uh, it, it is so large it, it's it's sometimes you know you just have to take a step back and say you know could this actually be true <laughs> <laughs> right yeah but but it's but and you look around the world through and through history you see all the evidence that is reinforcing it, even to the point where I talked about that ten-nation empire, they're trying to model it after the New Atlantis, right? And the New Atlantis was the helm of world government, as they like to call it, and the golden age before the flood. And that's the story where Poseidon goes to, uh, or Iapetus, because of the same god, goes to Climene or Clido, depending on which, which version you're looking at, and creates ten Nephilim kings to rule... Um, Atlantis, and this is what they're trying to create in the new age millennium, or the age of Aquarius, or as Bacon calls it, the new Atlantis, for the end time. And what's important about that is that you have, a, have an organization that is created that's a secret society in the, in the 60s called the Club of Rome, who reports directly to the upper end of the Rosicrucians, whose job was to split the world up into ten groups of nations in preparation for world government. So, spheres of influence, trading blocks, and again, and I only say all of that is because to underline the point that the web and the scale is so immense, it's not if world government and the end times are going to happen, it's only when but it's only when the restrainer is removed, who we talked about earlier. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, uh, where are some of the places that people can find your work at, Gary? Sure. So, um, 
Lots of ways to get a hold of me. You can go to my website, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy.com. That's Genesis 6 with the number 6 Conspiracy.com. And you can get a hold of me um, through email there if you wanted to ask me some questions or if you wanted to get a hold of some of the, the documents that I was talking about. Or you can get a hold of me on Facebook where I do the posting of all of my um commentaries on my timeline and I also put them onto a couple Genesis 6 conspiracy pages and into a group, Jerry Wayne, the Genesis 6 conspiracy. So you can get a hold of me there or on Messenger. Again, if you want some of that information or you can just go to those areas and look for those postings. And you can also follow me or get a hold of me on Twitter, which I also connect into for all of those commentaries at Gary Wayne 63 at Gary Wayne 63. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on again. Thank you for all the great information. Um, as always, it's it's so awesome to have you on here, man. You're 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 one of the best out there, best in the business, in in, in my opinion. So uh, I really appreciate you, and I uh, thank you for coming on, Gary. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, I thought. Uh, you know, I think we've, we've passed on a lot of good information tonight, and hopefully it leads people to dig a little bit deeper into some of these subjects that I think are very important, and that people understand that as fantastic as some of the things that we talk about, it's all in the Bible, Absolutely. and you just have to look for it. Absolutely. All right, well, thank you, Gary. Thank you, and good night. Now, uh, to my listeners, I just want to thank you for joining me. Uh, www.speaker.com forward slash user forward slash best damn podcast. YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash the best damn podcast. This will be posted in three episodes. So, three episodes. Look for it. Thank you guys. I love you. God bless you. And I will see you next time. recorded on 9-24-2018 um, and the reason uh, I done this one tonight is so we could put it together in one nice neat episode for everyone so kind of disregard uh, what was spoken there uh, I just really want to thank Gary Wayne for joining the show um, he's been on before but I think he really rocked it this time and done such an awesome job so much information um, just so much wisdom and knowledge and he's Truly, truly a genuine, awesome guy. Like, on a personal level, he really is. He walks the walk. He doesn't just talk it. Um, if you would, please follow uh, on Spreaker to, to get the updates. That way you can join us every time we go live. And tonight, we will be going live after this episode airs. Um, probably 11.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Maybe a little sooner if I can get together. Just a lot of things. Uh, so follow www.spreaker.com forward slash user forward slash best damn podcast. And please, our YouTube channel has been deleted and taken down uh, several times. So we're fighting censorship heavy right now. So please like, share, comment, and subscribe. YouTube.com forward slash the best damn podcast. Remember, Jesus is true to the way of life. I love you guys. God bless you.